G'day church family, it's great to be with you today, this is the Lord's Day. A very warm welcome to each and every one of you. Thank you for joining us here at the Christian Reformed Church of Casey. My name is Michael, I'm the pastor here, and on behalf of our leadership, thank you so much for joining us to worship our God in spirit and in truth. A couple of announcements as we start. that. Um, straight after our service around 11 o'clock. Encourage everyone to grab a cuppa and join us on Zoom online. A link has been emailed to you and all the details are in our new sheet that you would have received through email. Please join us and uh, say good day and see some familiar faces that we've missed seeing for over six long months. So yeah, please join us, have a cuppa with us and it's good to see some familiar faces. Secondly, on the 8th of October, we are having our church's annual general meeting. And all of the details have been sent to you over the email. And uh, please join us on that Thursday night for that really important meeting where we get to hear how the Lord has blessed us over the last 12 months and also our future plans into the next year that we are praying that the Lord will bless and guide us in the coming year. Finally, a quick announcement for our care team. We, as every year, we uh, have Christmas shoe boxes that we send overseas. And this year, given COVID, we're doing it quite differently. So again, please refer to all the details in our news sheet. And together, we can help reach the lost for Christ, even through this uh, avenue. Let's come to the Lord as we prepare our hearts to worship Him. And we're going to do that in a moment of silent prayer as we yeah, humble our hearts before the Lord and prepare our hearts and our minds to worship our Lord. And then Andrew Wheeler will lead us in our call to worship and greeting. So let's come to the Lord in a time of silent prayer. Let's pray. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Incline your ear to us and grant unto us your peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, congregation. It's great that we can worship the Lord together. And at the start of this service, we acknowledge that our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of the heaven and the earth. And this sovereign God of ours greets us with these words from 2 Corinthians. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. And all of God's people say, Amen. And the Lord calls us to worship with these words from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, from verse 14 to 18. Don't become partners with those who do not believe. For what partnership is there between righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship does light have with darkness? What agreement does Christ have with Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? And what agreement does the temple of God have with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will dwell and walk with among them, and I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore come out from among them, and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch any unclean thing, and I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you will be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. God calls us to worship him, to come out from the world, to come out from the sin that's around us, the idolatry, the, the, the evil of the world, and that we come from the world and we come to worship the Lord, that he is our Father and we are his children, and he invites us to worship him. And may we come this morning in this service to worship our Lord because he is worthy 
and because he calls us to. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you that you call us to worship. Thank you, Lord, that although we live in, a, in the world, Lord, that you call us out of the world to come before your throne of grace, to speak of your majesty, to worship you in spirit and in truth. And Lord, we pray that you would accept the worship from our hearts and from our lips this morning, for Christ's sake and in his name. Amen. Good morning, Casey. Welcome to our church service today. Um, we're going to start our time of um, worship through music off by shouting Hosanna.
Morning, boys and girls. <laughs> it's so good to well, it's not good to see you because you, I can't see you, but you can see me. And today, because I'm thinking about you all the time, I brought along the Tater people to say hello to you as well. Now you remember them, don't you? As sweet Tater is the mama, and the dictator is the father, and then the two tiny tots. And the tiny tots are so excited because they had a whole lot of toys given to them. So they had a ball each, that's for sport and playing with. They had a puzzle. They went to the petting zoo and they brought home some animals to play with, some toy animals. Then they had a top can you see the top spinning? Have you ever spun a top? And they had another one too with a light in it. Can you see the light? And as it spins, that light goes around and around and around. There was a slinky. I'm sure a lot of you have got slinkies as well. And then have you ever played marbles? Let your mum and dads know how to play marbles. I've got some marbles here. Well, they were going to have a lovely time playing. And then there was something completely new that they hadn't seen before. And that was, well, I don't know what you'd call that. It goes like this. See how that goes around and around and around? And then when it's twisted, you can pull it apart like that and it twists and turns and spins like a top but in your hands. And if you can do it hard enough, it'll even make a noise. My children used to laugh at this when I made this because they said something about it must, it must be very good for you. And then they had their cars to play with. Well, did they have a good time with all their toys. After a while, mum and dad called. But they said, no, we don't want to come back to you. We're too happy playing with our toys. We want our toys. No, mum and dad. We don't need you, we're happy here. We can play with these all day long and all, uh, we don't even need to go to bed all that much. We can play with these things. Our sport, our tops, our cars. Oh, the cars are so much fun. But do you know, after a while, these two little tiny tots, they got a little bit sick of their toys. They were getting tired, they were getting hungry. And even though their mum and dad had been calling them and they'd been saying, no, 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 I don't want to go back to you. I want to play with my toys. After a while they thought, hmm, these toys don't give us food. These toys don't look after us. It's fun playing with them for a while, but they don't really look after us. 
maybe we should go back to mum and dad, but uh, we feel a bit guilty because we said we didn't want to go back to mum and dad and we, we hurt them. Do you think they'll be angry at us? But their mum and dad kept calling them. And after a while, they were so tired and hungry and sad, they thought, well, we'll go back to mum and dad and we'll say, sorry, mum and dad, these toys are not better than you after all. We need you because we, we love you and we know that you love us and you look after us and you, you provide all the things that we need so much and you give us the most beautiful hugs. The car can't give us hugs. The sport can't give us hugs. It's only good for a little while, but you're there always looking after us. So mum and dad were very, very happy because their children had come back to him. It's a little bit like that with us. Sometimes we think, I'd like you to think of mum and dad as being God and the tiny tots being us and we're running away from God and playing with all the things that this world can give us. Our cars and our toys and our sport, all the things that we like in this world which sometimes we think are more important than God but it's not so. God loves us so much that he just forgave our sins and we can go back to him at any time and say, sorry, God, please forgive us. And the Bible says in today's reading that the ways of the Lord are right and the righteous walk in him and with him. So that's what we need to learn today. Now, because you haven't seen one of these things before, I'm going to show you how to make them. They're very easy. It'll be something for you to do in the school holidays. You need a button. Now, I'm pretty pleased because I've got a really big button and a bit of very strong string or wool. And all you need to do is pass it through one hole, two hole button, and pass it through another hole. Bring, it to, bring the ends together and put a knot in them. There you go. That's all it that is. And then you can twist it. A, a, whoop, not quite like that. You don't let it go. You twist it around and around and around like that. And then you can start twisting like that as well. See how that works? You might have a, have a few practices. Maybe mum and dad can show you. Can you he even hear it? You need stronger string than this though. That's all for today. Remember, God loves us. He calls us. He wants us to get away from the worldly things and return to him. Thank you, Jane, for sharing with our children. And a big thank you to Andrew for preaching for us this morning so that I could enjoy a week at the Reformed Theological College's preaching conference on the book of Deuteronomy. This past week I've been saturated in that book and savouring again uh, God's gracious laws that he gave Moses to give to the people. And these laws that we are going to read today is in response to what the Lord has done for his people. The law starts with the Lord saying, I have rescued you from Egypt. Therefore, keep these commandments. And that's really important as we read these laws in response, that we first recognize that we are to keep these in gratitude for the Lord saving us, in thankfulness for the Lord rescuing us from sin and saving us only through the gracious work of Jesus Christ. And so in response to that, in gratitude for that, in savouring the gospel of grace, 
that we can keep these laws and live holy and pleasing lives. So let's read what God says to us in his law. And if you would say the words under people, And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. You shall have no other gods before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. You shall not make for yourself an idol. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For He is our God and we are the people of His pasture, the flock under His care. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your prayers. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. Honour your father and your mother. Remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you are good, O Lord. You shall not murder. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me. You shall not commit adultery. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. You shall not steal. Have mercy on me, O God. Blot out my transgressions. You shall not gives false testimony against your neighbour. Keep me from deceitful ways. Be gracious to me through your law. You shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbour. Turn my heart toward your statutes and not toward selfish gain. Save me from all my transgressions. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Our God, our Father in heaven, Lord, we pray and say that holy is your name. Lord, hallowed is your name. Lord, when we've read that law that you've given us to live by, Lord, when we think about how you want us to live, Lord, these laws convict us of our sinfulness. And Lord, show us our Lord's perfect righteousness. Lord, the standard which you want us to live by. And Lord, we couldn't keep this in our own strength. But we thank you, Lord, that one who is perfect, who is sinless, has kept these laws. He is the end of the law. He has fulfilled the law. And that is your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, through his death and resurrection, Lord, we are declared right, justified before our Lord, just as if we'd not sinned. And Lord, thank you that you declare us right only by your amazing grace. And Lord, in gratitude for you saving us sinners, in thankfulness for what you have done for us. Lord, our proper, our right response is one of gratitude in living out these laws and seeking to worship you by living holy and pleasing lives. So Lord, please help us to keep these laws. And Lord, that you through your Holy Spirit will keep growing and molding us and shaping us more like Christ. So Lord, please, would you help us, Lord, Lord, we confess our many sins and we come to you in need of your, your forgiveness on our lives. And thank you, Lord, for your amazing grace that forgives us and cleanses us from all of our unrighteousness. And Lord, you help us and you gift us the Holy Spirit to live in us 
and to fight temptation each and every day. So may your Holy Spirit, Lord, work powerfully in us. Lord, help us to go to your word daily uh, and be sanctified through your word, Lord, as your Spirit does that work of convicting us and growing us more like Christ. Father, we also thank you that we can bring our points of praise and uh, thankfulness to you. And Lord, this past week we've again acknowledged your hand at work. Lord, thank you so much for bringing the COVID infections, uh, the numbers down each and every day. And Lord, we look forward to restrictions being eased here in Victoria. Father, we thank you that you have healed many of our members this past week. And Lord, we want to give you thanks for them. Thank you so much that uh, Andrew and Patsy could celebrate their 50th wedding anniversary. Father, we pray that you will encourage us through this milestone. Thank you for being with them and also with all our marriages in our church family, Lord. Lord, that you'll protect them and grow them uh, and uh, look after our, our family homes. Lord, we also want to pray for those who need your healing hand. And Lord, we think of Kathy and Ryan and Tim who go in for surgeries this coming week. Lord, we think of our teachers, our educational staff, our school children who are on holidays. Lord, we pray that you'll give them rest. And also as our year 12 students start the process of preparing for their exams. Please be with them, Lord. Lord, we think of Anne-Marie and the passing of her dear mum. Lord, we thank you that she believed in the Lord Jesus. And Lord, that she is with you. And we thank you for that comfort and that grand hope that believers have. Father, we also want to pray that you will help us worship through our giving and our offerings. Thank you, Lord, for our local church that our members give toward and also for our church's development expenses that we are waiting on you for our church property here. Lord, thank you also that we can now open your word and read it. Lord, be with Andrew as he preaches your word and Lord, help us to not only be hearers but also doers of your word. Lord, applying the word in our lives ahead. So Lord, thank you and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hosea chapter 14 from verse 1. Israel, return to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled in your iniquity. Take words of repentance with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, forgive all our iniquity and accept what is good, so that we may repay you with praise from our lips. Assyria will not save us. We will not ride on horses and we will no longer proclaim our gods to the work of our, of our hands. For the fatherless receives compassion in you. I will heal their apostasy. I will freely love them, for my anger will have turned from him. I will be like the dew to Israel. He will blossom like the lily and take root like the cedars of Lebanon. His new branches will spread and his splendor will be like the olive tree his fragrance like the forest of Lebanon. The people will return and live beneath his shade. They will grow grain and blossom like the vine. His renown will be like the wine of Lebanon. Ephraim, why should I have anything more to do with idols? It is I who answer and watch over him. I am like a flourishing pine tree. Your fruit comes from me. Let whoever is wise understand these things and whoever is insightful recognize them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the righteous walk in them, but the rebellious stumble in them. Thank you, Stephen, for reading God's word for us. And let us pray that the Holy Spirit would help us as we now meditate upon this word, uh, that the Holy Spirit would illuminate our hearts and our minds and speak to us. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that your word is truth. Thank you that we can meditate upon your word this morning, knowing that your Holy Spirit ministers this word to our hearts. Lord, we ask that you would help us, that you would teach us, that you would speak to us, 
that you would shape us and change us as we sit under your word this morning. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would take the words and apply them to our hearts and our minds. May we be not just hearers of your word, but doers also. May your word inspire us and change us for your sake and for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We are living in difficult times. The isolation and the lockdown has been going on for a very long time now and uh, a lot of people are struggling. And as is often the case in difficult times, it really brings out what's really deep in our hearts. I know that for some of you this has been a good thing, that by having the activities of the world taken away and a lot of the things that we would normally occupy our time uh, that we can't do anymore, I know a lot of you are, are using this extra time to be in God's Word more. Some of you are listening to more sermons during the week. Some of you are spending more time in prayer or in family worship. And there's a lot of good that comes out of this. It forces us to reprioritize what's important to us. And for a lot of us, we realize how dependent we are upon God. That in the midst of adversity, we turn to him knowing that he is sovereign, that we can trust him to be in control of this. And so we actually have a greater sense of peace, a greater sense of comfort. For some of us, though, maybe it's, it's bringing out more sin in our lives. Where are we turning to? Maybe instead of turning to God's word, some of us are turning to the constant news feed. Perhaps some of us are, are spending time rather than reading God's word, but we're spending that time on Facebook, hours upon hours, scrolling through feeds and posting things and commenting. Instead of looking to the Lord for help, some of us are looking to our politicians as if they're the ones that are going to save us or rescue us from this time. And, and for some of us, instead of having that peace and that comfort from knowing God is in control, we have fear and anxiety. Hosea is writing to God's people Israel at a time where they too were experiencing difficulty. The Israelites were in a time of civil unrest. There was the threat of invasion and attack from the neighbouring nations. There was political turmoil, one evil king after another, assassinations. There was sin rampant through society. But instead of, in this time of difficulty, turning to the Lord, the Israelites were looking elsewhere. They were looking to worldly alliances. They were looking to Assyria. Instead of turning to the Lord and trusting in his provision, they were looking to their worldly possessions to rely upon them. Instead of worshipping only the true and living God, they were bringing in idol worship from the nations around them, Baal worship and worshipping idols. Whilst in some ways... 7th and 8th century BC, Israel is a little bit different to our time today. In many ways, the fundamental diagnosis is the same. And we will see in our text that Hosea's closing message to God's people then is a message for God's people today. It's a message for you. And we will see that the message is this. Be wise forsake the world and trust in Christ alone for he will forgive you and bless you. We will see the message is this, be wise, forsake the world and trust in Christ alone for he will forgive you and bless you. So we see that Hosea's message was for God's people then and it's a message for you today. Have a look at verse 1 of our text. Israel, return to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled in your iniquity. Hosea's message is to Israel. It's not to the, the world around. It's not to the pagan nations. It's not to the people who reject God. His message is to Israel. And we must understand that Israel was living in the midst of the world. They were surrounded by other nations that were worshipping false gods and, and they were sinning against God. The problem that Israel had was that their religion, their worship of God was syncretistic. 
And what that means is that, yes, they had the true religion. They worshipped God. They had the temple and the sacrifices and the commandments of God. Yes, they were God's people. But they were bringing in all this other stuff from outside. They were blending their worship with the worship of idols, the worship of Baal. They were blending their, their worship of God with the sinful practices of the world, sexual immorality. They were mixing this religion with that that was around them rather than being God's people in the world to influence the world around they were allowing the world that's around them to influence and change them a couple of weeks ago we had a movie night with the kids and we watched the sound of music and we had to explain to Anna and Max what these nuns were. They were these group of ladies dressed the same, living in the same place, worshipping God. And we had to explain that these people feel that in their worship of God they are to come out of the world and to live together in this safe, sacred space. But God has not called us to be nuns in a convent. God has not called us to be monks in a monastery. God has called us to be the light of the world, the salt of the earth, a city on the hill. God has called us to be his people in the world that we may influence the world for him. But sometimes the danger in being in the world is that we allow the world to influence us and to creep into our worship of God. We must be aware of this reality. We must not think that just because we are God's people that we are protected from the influence of the world. We have to be aware that we are in the world and like Israel, we too are susceptible to the danger of giving in to the practices of the world around us. Examine how you are walking with God whilst you are walking in this world. And are you influencing the world around for God? Or to what extent are you being influenced by the world around? As this message is for you, you must also hear God's call to repent and return to him. God's message is for you, and so you also must hear God's call to repent and return. Have a look at verse 2. Take words of repentance with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, forgive all our iniquity and accept what is good so that we may repay you. God is giving the Israelites the words to say as they come in repentance. We see there's a, a plea for forgiveness of sin. Accept what is good is a difficult phrase in the Hebrew. It can actually be translated, receive us graciously. So there's a confession of sin. There's an appeal to God's grace, recognising that we don't deserve this forgiveness, but it's his goodness offered to us. And then our response is to repay God with the praise from our lips or the sacrifice of praise from our lips. This is an invitation for us to come and receive God's mercy. You see, we, we all have stumbled in our sin. And perhaps we might not have stumbled as much as Israel at that time. But we must confess that we are all guilty of sin. No one is perfect have a look at 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1, verse, verses 8 to 10. It says, If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. You see, we all in some way have fallen short of God's perfect standard. So we must not come to God with pride. You must not come to God like the Pharisees of Jesus' day with stiff necks thinking that they are God's people and they are so worthy of his blessings. No, you must come to God in humility and brokenness. As David says in Psalm 51, that the sacrifice that's acceptable to God is that of a broken and contrite heart. We realise that we are sinners in need of God's grace. 
Have a look at the end of verse 3. It says, For the fatherless receives compassion in you. The fatherless, the orphans. It's when we realise that we have total dependence upon God that we are ready to come and receive his mercy. Have a look at verse 3. Assyria will not save us and we will not ride on horses and we will no longer proclaim our gods to the work of our hands. These are the words that God is giving his people as a prayer of confession. And God wants them to identify specific areas of sin. It's not a general prayer of, Lord, forgive us for our sin, but it's specific areas of sin. Assyria will not save us. There's a, there's a confession of the fact that they were turning to neighbouring nations for allegiance with them rather than allegiance with God. We will not ride on horses. There's an acknowledgement that they were trusting in their possessions rather than in God. And there's a confession of idol worship, that they were worshipping other gods, false gods. About four or five years ago, I had to say sorry to my wife for something. And I know many of you may have had to apologise to your spouse or, or to a friend or perhaps someone else in the church for something that you've done wrong. But when we apologise, it's so important that we don't just say sorry. Saying sorry is completely meaningless unless you're specific in what you're sorry for. It's not enough to say, Laurie, I'm sorry. Well, sorry for what? But to say, sorry that I said that or sorry that I did this particular thing. And so it is when we confess our sin to God, it's not enough to be vague and general but God wants us to be specific, to identify and confess specific sins in our lives. It says in, at the start of verse 2, take words of repentance. And so be specific in your repentance. Identify and confess specific sins. Now yours might not be the same as those of Israel. You might not have an alliance with a sinful pagan nation. But to what extent are you living outside God's perfect law? To what extent is your heart on the things of the world and have you allowed the world to influence you? To what extent is your worship of God less than it should be? Identify those specific sins and confess them to the Lord. You must hear God's call to repent and return. And when you do, God will forgive your sin and he will heal your waywardness because of Christ. When you repent and return to God, he will heal your sin, forgive your sin, and heal your waywardness because of Christ. Have a look at verse 4. I will heal their apostasy. I will freely love them, for my anger will have turned from him. This forgiveness, this healing is something that God does. I will heal their apostasy. And apostasy means backsliding. It's a falling away from the faith. And we may be in different degrees of that. Maybe we're, we're living pretty good, but we've fallen back in, in some small areas. Or maybe we've really slid back from the faith. But wherever we are, God is the one who heals our waywardness. Hosea was talking to God's people about the judgment that was going to come because of their disobedience. And the judgment would come and, and it was not long after this that the Israelites were taken captive by Assyria. The very nation that they were turning to for deliverance was the country that came in and destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel and took God's people into uh, exile. And Hosea's hope was that these people in exile under God's judgment would remember God's covenant promises, remember the invitation for them to repent and return and that God would heal them and restore them. And that is what God did. But this is a picture of deliverance and it's a picture of the ultimate deliverance that comes in Jesus Christ. You see, how is it that God's anger has turned away from them, as it says? Well, Romans chapter 3 tells us that God in his forbearance withheld his anger at that time so that he would place it upon Jesus Christ to display his righteousness. 
God forgave them because of Jesus Christ. And it's the same for us. How is God's anger turned away from our sin? It's in Jesus Christ. As a lot of us have been doing in this time of isolation, I have um, done a little bit of online shopping. In the last fortnight, I've probably purchased about six, six or so things from the internet, and every single one came with the promise of free delivery. Free delivery. But it's an illusion. There is no such thing as free delivery. You see, the price that I've paid for the product pays for the delivery. You see, the person that sends that doesn't get the delivery for free, they have to pay for it. The items don't deliver themselves. It's not free. Someone has to pay for the delivery. And it's no different when we think of our deliverance from sin. Hebrews chapter 9 tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Our forgiveness comes at a cost, but the cost is paid by God in sending his son, Jesus Christ, into the world to die on the cross to pay the penalty that we should pay for our sin. Beloved, we receive this gift of God's grace by faith. It was the same in the Old Testament. It's the same today. It's a gift of God's grace. And receive this gift of faith, this gift of God's grace by faith in Christ. It is because of Christ that God forgives and heals you of your waywardness. And it is Christ himself who is your true blessing. It is Christ himself who is your true blessing. Have a look at verse 5. It says, I will be like the Jew to Israel. It doesn't say I will give the Jew to Israel or I will provide the Jew to Israel, but no, I will be like the Jew to Israel. God himself is the blessing. And what is the Jew? Well, the Jew is the moisture that, that comes on the ground overnight, refreshes the ground. And that might be the Jew to you. But what was the Jew to the Jews? You see, the Jew to the Jews had significance. Hosea has reminded God's people of a number of times in this book of how God has rescued them from Egypt. And it was in that 40 years wilderness experience that God provided for them the manna. And the manna, the bread from heaven, was provided in the Jew. And Jesus in the New Testament says that he is the bread from heaven, that he is the bread of life. It's a picture of God giving us Jesus Christ into the world, the bread of heaven. It's Jesus himself that's the blessing. In, in the past two weeks, I have attended three funerals online and I know many of you have attended a number of funerals as well. And it's interesting that when you read the tributes on the, on the page, how no one says that what they miss about the person was how well they did their job Monday to Friday, nine to five. No one says that they miss a particular thing that they did or a gift. No, what we miss about these people, what we cherish the most is who they were, when we could enjoy their company, conversations we've had with them, times we've shared. And so it is with Jesus Christ. We do not come to him for what he can give to us or for what he has done, but we come to him for who he is. Don't come to God to pursue a religion. Don't come to God to pursue a tradition. Don't come to God to have some social identity with good people. Don't even come to God for the, the secondary benefits that we receive or, or for the lie that is the prosperity gospel. Pursue Jesus Christ. Pursue Jesus Christ. For Christ himself is your true blessing. And you can trust in him because of God's covenant faithfulness. Christ is our true blessing. And furthermore, we can trust in him because of God's covenant faithfulness. Have a look at verses 5 to 7. 
I will be like the Jew to Israel. He will blossom like the lily and take root like the cedars of Lebanon. His new branches will spread and his splendor will be like the olive tree, his fragrance like the forest of Lebanon. The people will return and live beneath his shade, protection under the shade of God. They will grow grain and blossom like the vine, its fruitfulness. His renown will be like the wine of Lebanon. This is poetic. Hosea is interesting. It's not poetry as such, but it's very poetic in the language that Hosea uses. And we have here a great picture of an abundant blessing that God uh, gives to his people. Now don't be mistaken, this is not a blessing of worldly prosperity. And in fact, what we see at the start and the end of this blessing is God's covenant faithfulness. Have a look at verse 5. I will be like the Jew to Israel. The Jew, remember that. And then verse 7 at the end. They will grow grain and blossom like the vine. The Jew, the grain and the vine. Remember that. And let's turn to Genesis chapter 27. Genesis, the first book of the Bible, in chapter 27. And we will have a look at the words that Isaac gives in passing on the covenant blessing to his son Jacob. And his son Jacob was named Israel. This is the words that Isaac gives to Israel in passing on the covenant blessing of God. Verses 27 and 28. So he came closer and kissed him. When Isaac smelled his clothes, he blessed him and said, Ah, the smell of my son. It is like the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give to you from the dew of the sky and from the richness of the land an abundance of grain and new wine. The dew, the grain and the wine. The Israelites, when in hearing this message from Hosea, would have understood the covenant blessing of God the covenant that God made with Abraham, that he made with Abraham's son Isaac, that he made with Isaac's son Jacob, who was called Israel. And more than anything else, the covenant promise to these people was a promise of redemption. More than anything else, it's a promise of redemption. And when you look at this covenant promise and you trace it through the Old Testament, you see the fulfilment in Jesus Christ. The strength of the promise is only as good as the one that makes it. We all know someone who you, you can't believe a promise that's made. And there's, there's people we know who if they promise something, we know they will do it. But a promise by God is an absolute certainty. How well do you know your Bible? Study the Old Testament and you will see God's covenant faithfulness and it will strengthen your faith. Some people feel that the Old Testament is irrelevant and, and they only read the New Testament. Maybe your Bible only has the New Testament. But no, beloved, we must study God's Old Testament because it shows us this covenant promises that God has made and brought to fulfilment in Jesus Christ. And when you study that, your faith in Christ will grow. This is what uh, Hebrews chapter 6 describes, this hope, the hope in knowing that God keeps his promises. This hope is an anchor for your soul, sure and steadfast. Christ is eternally trustworthy, so be wise, forsake the world and trust in Christ alone. We can trust Christ because of God's covenant faithfulness. So be wise, beloved. Forsake the world and trust in Christ alone. Have a look at verse 8. Ephraim, why should I have anything more to do with idols? It is I who answer and watch over him. I am like a flourishing pine tree. Your fruit comes from me. It's a claim by God for exclusivity. Ephraim, which is interchangeable with Israel. Ephraim, why should I have anything more to do with your idols? God requires exclusivity of worship. We also see it's a, it's a claim for sufficiency. It is God who answers and watches over Israel. 
Your fruit comes from me. Your blessing doesn't come from the works of your own hands. It doesn't come from the security you have in your own job or in your family or in the world around you. God is the one who provides and it's a claim for satisfaction. Hosea's marriage to a woman named Goma was an object lesson for the people of Israel. Hosea married a woman named Goma and in this marriage that should have been characterised by exclusivity and by sufficiency and by satisfaction was broken when Goma went and committed adultery. She broke away from that exclusivity and that sufficiency and that satisfaction that she ought to have had in her marriage to Hosea. And God says, that's a picture of you. The the people of Israel had broken away from their, their marriage to God, as it were, and they no longer enjoyed that exclusivity, that satisfaction and that sufficiency in him, and they were committing adultery with the, the world around them, with the, the, the other gods of, of the nations around them, with the sinful practices of these other people. Have a look at verse 9. Let whoever is wise understand these things, and whoever is insightful recognise them. There's this poetic parallelism. These two lines are saying the same thing. Whoever is wise or whoever is insightful, let them understand or recognise these things. Let them see these things. For the ways of the Lord are right and the righteous walk in them, but the rebellious stumble in them. What he's saying is that the ways of the Lord, that only the ways of the Lord are right. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. You see, Jesus is the cornerstone. Either he will be the foundation of our life and of our faith, our rock, or he will be a rock of offence, the stone that the builders rejected. But he is the way, the truth and the life. Whenever I come home on my keys, I have two golden keys. I have a key for my front door at home and I have a key for my office. And they're both gold, they're the same shape, the same size, they look identical. And often I'll come home and I'll have my hands full of things and I'll get my keys out and I'll get a gold key and I'll put it in the lock but it won't turn. It won't open the door because it's not the right key. It's the same colour, it's the same shape, it looks the same, it's a key. But unless it's exactly the right key, it will not open the door. And beloved, even if I had the right key, if I was to take bits away from it, unless it's exactly the right key, it will not work. Or if I add things onto it, it will no longer work. And so it is with our faith in God. We must have the way, Jesus. Beloved, put off the world Give up everything that takes you away from Christ and fix your eyes upon him for he alone is the way, the truth and the life. Be wise, beloved. Forsake the world and trust in Christ alone for he will forgive you and bless you. You might be thinking that that you have faith, you have belief, you're a Christian, you come to church, you read the Bible, you believe. But when you step back and look at your life the way God sees it, what parts of the world are hindering your walk with God? Christ might be on the throne of your life, but the question is this, what else is on the throne with him? Have you heard these words from the prophet Hosea this morning? His plea to God's people. He saw God's judgment. God's judgment was coming because of their sin. He saw the people being taken into exile, taken captive by the world. And his plea is that they might remember God's covenant faithfulness, that they might repent of their sin and return to the Lord. I don't know where you're at in your walk with the Lord. You might be doing pretty well. You might have everything pretty well right. You might be in the midst of Israel, but maybe part of your heart is in the world. Maybe you've allowed some part of the world or of the sin around you to influence the way you live your life or the way you worship God. 
Or maybe you're completely backslidden. Maybe you've fallen away from the faith. Maybe you're in Babylon. You're in exile. Wherever you are, the message is to repent and return to the Lord and he will heal you of your waywardness and he will forgive you of your sin. God in his mercy has not yet brought final judgment, but final judgment will come. God has promised it and we know that God keeps his promises. But when that final judgment comes, beloved, may you be found safe, living beneath the shade of Jesus Christ, like we saw in verse 7, and enjoying the blessing of knowing him as your Saviour and your Lord. Be wise, forsake the world, and trust in Christ alone, for he will forgive you and bless you. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that in your mercy you have given us prophets to tell us about our heart. Lord, and we acknowledge that this message of Hosea, a message written many centuries ago for your people at a different time, in a different part of the world, and yet your word speaks to us today. Father, we thank you that you are a God of grace and mercy. And that the invitation for us is to return, to repent, to confess our sin. And Lord, that you promise to forgive us because of Jesus Christ. Lord, may we turn to him. May we keep our eyes on him, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Lord, may we hold on to him. He is our blessing. May we know him. May we follow him. May we love him with all our heart. Lord, would you refine in our hearts Sanctify us from the things of the world. Show us the areas in our life where we have been led astray. And may we come back to you. Father, we thank you for your word. Please hear our prayer for Jesus' sake. Amen. He is my light, my strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm, what heights of love. Just cry to final prayer.